Okay, we're going to continue uh, talking about sulfur chemistry. And uh, when we left off, I think we left off talking about sulfonium ions. And so now let's talk about substitution processes of sulfur. And I want to compare these three classes of sulfur functional groups. Uh, sulfenyl chlorides, sulfonyl chlorides, and sulfonyl chlorides. And there's a huge difference in rates in terms of the rate at which you substitute these. Of course, in this case, chloride uh, would be the group that gets substituted the fastest. So we're talking about rates of substitution of the chlorine atom in these cases. And the lower the oxidation state, um, the faster you will substitute. Or conversely, the more of those oxoligands you have on there, the slower you want to substitute. So let's talk about the mechanisms for substitution. So if you look at the substitution of a uh, sulfenyl chloride <clears throat> by some kind of a nucleophile, this is an SN2 reaction. It's one of the few good SN2 reactions in organic chemistry. So as the nucleophile is coming in, the leaving group is leaving. This is a concerted displacement. And so the chloride will leave as the nucleophile comes in. <clears throat> but we should contrast that mechanism with sulfonyl chlorides. When we put an oxoligand on sulfur, now it changes. So now when the nucleophile attacks, the chloride does not actually leave at the same time. So you have to resist it. And it, it is true that the nucleophile will want to add opposite the chlorine atom. Uh, but you need to try to, if you're pushing arrows, kick the electrons over to the oxoligand. <coughs> so you have O minus. And then in a second step, the chloride will come out. So it's not concerted. And if that's not concerted, it's definitely not concerted for the sulfonyl chlorides um, <coughs> for displacement. And again, the nucleophile wants to attack opposite sulfur, um, but you have to resist the temptation to make the chloride leave at the same time. So again, kick the electrons over to one of these two oxo groups. And then in a second step, kick out the leaving group, the chloride leaving group, or whatever the leaving group is that's attached to the sulfur. Okay, so let's talk about those oxido ligands because they really slow down uh, the rates of attack <coughs> at sulfur. And I think you already know this, that it's slow to attack uh, sulfonyl atoms. Sometime uh, back in your uh, sophomore organic chemistry class, you learned about making tosylate leaving groups and mesylate leaving groups. If you have an alcohol and you want to make the leave, you don't want to just add acid to turn the OH into a leaving group. You make the tosylate. And when you do that, the magic is that when you treat this with a nucleophile, you don't see attack in the sulfonyl. That's very hard. So it's very hard to get nucleophiles to attack here, and that's why you make a sulfonate. So when you make a bond to carbon, what happens is you attack your own carbon. So it's very hard to attack sulfur. Right? It becomes easier to do SN2 reactions, which are generally lousy. Just to help you just um, <clears throat> to further home in on that point, let's take a look at this region called sulfuryl chloride. That's not thionyl chloride. This is nothing like thionyl chloride. This is called sulfuryl chloride. So probably more than half of you in here have used thionyl chloride for some raging the gas of chlorides or convert alcohols into chlorides. But this you don't use to make chlorides. It would be very unusual. I can think of one reaction where, where that's used for that. So when you treat sulfuryl chloride with nucleophiles, this acts as a chlorinating agent. It's like the equivalent of chlorine gas. Nucleophiles, again, it's very hard, um, or at least it's easier to attack here on the chlorine atom than it is to attack its sulfur. It's not impossible to attack its sulfur. So generally what you see is, see is some sort of a chlorination reaction. And you blow out sulfur dioxide gas. And you end up uh, chlorinating, doing an electrification <coughs> of your nucleophile. OK, so it's just not easy to attack sulfur when it's got those oxo ligands on. Let's 
throw out two uh, common reactions. So you make it easier by having a chloride substituent on, on your sulfonyl. I want to contrast two different mechanisms for sulfonyl substitution. One that is totally obvious um, and one that is not so obvious. When you take tosyl chloride and pyridine, this is the most common set of conditions uh, for converting alcohols into tosyl groups. So I'm going to go ahead and draw out this uh, So the mechanism, so what's the pyridine in there for? Why do you add pyridine to reactions? You don't add pyridine to reactions of alcohols to deprotonate alcohols. But if you want to, if you want to deprotonate the dimethyl alkoxide, you should use triethylamine for a stronger base. If you add pyridine to the reaction, you're putting it in there to pull off protons from strong acids. Pyridine is a weak base. So this is going to attack without being deprotonated by pyridine. And so you'll go through this trigonal bipyramidal intermediate when you kick some of the electrons over here to oxygen. It's kind of arbitrary which oxygen I choose. And now we're ready in, in the second step to pop out the chloride. But what happens faster? Do I pop up the chloride faster or do I deprotonate faster? Under these conditions, um, this chloride will leave faster if we first pull the proton off of this axial ligand, off of that alcohol ligand. After we pull that proton off, this will leave much faster. And so I'm not going to draw a sequence of steps, but you can see what's happening here. Deprotonate first and then pop off the chloride. The chloride will leave much faster than that if you don't have a positive charge on one of those ligands. And so that's the mechanism for substitution to make a tosylate leaving group. There's another common leaving group that people use in organic chemistry. And that's mesylate leaving groups. And the conditions are generally different. You generally do not use mesyl chloride in purity. If you're trying to make a mesylate leaving group, you almost invariably use triethylamine, and suddenly the mechanism changes. There's no way you could have known this. I don't think there's any possible way. What happens? And as soon as you see triethylamine, I would be thinking, oh, well, gee, they're probably adding that in there. <clears throat> they're probably adding the triethylamine because they want to make a small concentration of alkoxide anions. But what you couldn't have guessed is that this CH on the methyl group, Right? There's no CHs next to sulfur on, on a tosyl chloride. A toluene doesn't have protons here, but a methyl group does. And this deprotonates at sufficient rates that you get a small amount of this anion. Who would have guessed that? Who would have guessed that it would be acidic enough for, for either the small amount of alkoxide that's floating around or um, <clears throat> or triethylamine to pull that proton off. And now what happens is that that chloride leaves very quickly to generate an intermediate called a sulfene intermediate. And there's no way to generate a sulfene when you have an aryl sulfonyl chloride. It's planar. And there's still a tendency for things to attack in this reaction mixture. So now your alcohol that's floating around in here can attack this sulfene, and it can attack from either face. So we attack that sulfene. We now push the electrons back over. It's kind of like the, the, the transition state's kind of like the reverse of the chloride uh, leaving. And so now, <coughs> and so now you transfer some protons stick a proton here on the carbon and then pull a proton off of the oxygen and that's how you get that easily. Yes. So it attacks sulfur over carbon because sulfur is bigger? It attacks sulfur over carbon. Yeah, yeah that's instead of attacking going pi star C as you mean because the, you mean because the LUMO is bigger on sulfur. Yeah. Okay, so it's not because it's a larger atom. No, I don't know. Okay, so two different mechanisms for um, 
for substitution of sulfonyl chlorides, depending on whether it's a CH2 groups next to the sulfur. So all groups don't have that. Okay, so tosyl chloride does react relatively to an electrophile, but I want to talk about a really, really good electrophile now. And fast rates of substitution. I'm going to underline fast so we can remember fast here. Let me go ahead and take out a, um, this is one of the few cases of fast rates of, of SN2, and I'm going to draw out a very common reagent called beta mercaptoethanol. It's a thiol, it, it doesn't matter what the thiol is, this is just a common reagent in biology. And what I want to emphasize is that the pKa for this thiol is about 9.6, mid nines. Let me just write that down and let's just ponder on that for a moment. That means if you put this in aqueous solution, it's physiological pH. Physiological pH is somewhere between 7.2 and 7.6. <clears throat> that means about 1% of your thiols is depropionate, are depropionated at physiological pH. And that may not sound like much, 1%, but when you're talking about 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, 1% is a lot of molecules. And this is a screaming hot nucleophile. So whenever you have thiols in aqueous solution, um, <clears throat> around physiological pH, you've got enough thylates in there that they totally dominate the nucleophilic character of your reaction conditions. And if you put a thylate anion anywhere near a disulfide, so notice that these sulfur atoms here, both of them are divalent, they have only two things attached to them. Now you get a very, very, very fast SN2. SN2 reactions are generally poor. There's not that many cases where you get fast SN2 reactions. Oxygen, oxygen bonds, Bromine, bromine bonds. This is one of the cases where S and two reactions are fast. So this this leads to disulfide exchange. So I now have two different sulfur atoms connected, and this R group that acted as a leaving group is now floating around, and it can come back in and attack again. It can come back in and reattack very quickly the disulfide that you just formed. <clears throat> so this is the mechanism for disulfide exchange. It's S and two reactions. And this is the basis for protein disulfide formation. <clears throat> so I, I want to contrast what happens when you replace carbon uh, with sulfur. I think all of you know that there are no reactions anywhere in which you take a nucleophile and you displace, let me put this with a dashed arrow, because I don't want to pretend like that's any good. There's no reactions where you displace a hydroxide through, a, through an SN2 type mechanism. That's not to say that hydroxide can't act as a leaving group. If I put a carbon anion next to it, it could be but there's no intermolecular collision-based displacement of hydroxide units. But if I replace that with sulfur, let me try to organize it very, very carefully. This is called a sulfenic acid, and it's weird because you always you normally think of acids as having oxoligates like carboxylic acid, sulfonic acid. This is still called an acid. This is a sulfenic acid. And they're completely unstable. You can't isolate these. And the reason you can't isolate these is as soon as one sulfenic acid bounces into another, they displace hydroxide leaving Hydroxide can act as a leaving group in an SN2 reaction. You can't stop this stuff from happening. And again, this has to do with the very fast reactivity of divalent sulfur. Now there's a proton transfer step I'm not going to draw. In fact, there will be a proton here on this oxygen after you attack. I'm not going to show the point at all. The important point is it's very fast to attack a divalent sulfur. Super duper fast. And again, inconveniently fast because it means you can't work with, with sulfenic acids that you want to stable. <coughs> That's not to say that you can't work with sulfenyl type reagents. And so let me give you an example of a sulfenylating reagent. <clears throat> so if you take an alkene and you use this pi bond as your nucleophile, uh, you can add divalent sulfur reagents. So for example, sulfenyl chlorides. 
just looking at that, it looks so reactive. But that sulfur chlorine bond, right? If it's easy to displace hydroxide, imagine how easy this is to displace. And what's going to happen is very much like addition of Cl2 across a double bond. Right? If you had Br2 across a double bond, you'll get this three member ring for ammonium or chlorine Cl2, yes? So if the um, chloride version of the sulfenyl, uh, why is that stable with itself and the hydroxide is not? I think the chlorine just deactivates the lone pairs on here. So oh, okay. another sulfenyl chloride can't pop out. There could be some reverse. I have to think about it. Maybe it's reverse. Maybe it's a reversibility to equal every function. Yeah, let me think about that before I answer that. Okay, so the mechanism. Of course, that's going to be bad. But there's lone pairs on the sulfur. So as this gets closer and closer to the double bond, these electrons will come back in until you'll get this three-membered ring onium intermediate. So it's not an epoxide. You'd call that an epi-sulfide. But there's a phenyl group on here, so it's not even an epi sulfide. We call this an epi sulfonium ion. Kind of a weird name. But it's kind of like the word epoxide. And as you might guess, it's very easy for things to open this back up. So that chloride that you have floating around in there can come back in and open up that epi sulfonium ion from the opposite face. So this is kind of like epoxide chemistry. And this can be reversible. I think you learned about neighboring group participation last quarter. Right, as soon as I see that, I'm thinking, gee, that sulfur could bend over and pop the chloride back out. So if you heat this up, you'll see reactions where the lone pairs push the chloride back out, and it can regenerate small amounts of that epi sulfonium intermediate. OK, so sulfenol, anything, sulfur, dimethyl sulfur is reactive. When you've got potential so you're screaming hot reactivity, uh, screaming fast reactions. This F might bother you because people in the UK put pH, sulfurase, sulfur. Forget that. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and draw out more reactions uh, of those lone pairs on sulfur so we can get a sense for how you can do substitution reactions via sulfurane intermediates. So if I take this sort of thioether or sulfide, we're using older nomenclature, and I treat that with some sort of an electrophile. It doesn't matter whether this is Cl2 or just some sort of reactive compound. What will happen is the lone pairs on sulfur will attack. In this case, it could be chlorine we're using. And you'll get this sulfonium intermediate. Right? Three things attached to sulfur, I'm going to call that a sulfonium intermediate. I don't really need to specify what those algorithms are. <clears throat> And I'm going to draw that lone pair in there just so we can remember that there's still a lone pair in sulfur. That's kind of tetrahedral. It's pyramidal. <clears throat> and so whatever this X group is can come back in. And it doesn't have to be the, the leading group, but any other nucleophilic group can now come back in and attack the sulfur. And you have to resist the temptation to do an SN2 reaction. It's not to say that X can't replace the chlorine, but it's not in one step. You'll generate this intermediate that has two axial groups and then three equatorial groups. And this is called a sulfurane intermediate. So resist the temptation to do an SN2 and generate an intermediate like this. If you want to make the chloride leave, do it that in a second step. Right? If, if, if you want the chloride to leave and we make a sulfonium intermediate, it's not considered in the second step. And there's nothing weird about this intermediate. It's perfectly fine. If you buy sulfur tetrafluoride gas, I can't imagine you'll be buying that anytime soon, but it looks just like that sulfur intermediate. You can buy sulfur intermediates um, from Aldrich. There's nothing weird about this. So don't feel like you have to make the leaving group leave as the nucleophile is attacking that sulfur. This turns out to be these types of sulfurane intermediates turn out to be very common uh, in 
and sulfur chemistry. So let's go ahead and take an example uh, where those are common. There are a vast number of alcohol oxidation reactions that are based, or that are mechanistically similar to this one reaction. I think if we can get the Cori Kim oxidation here, uh, then we can easily imagine uh, what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and start off here with a uh, uh, dimethyl <coughs> sulfide. That's the key reagent here, and of course, chem oxidation. And the other reagent that you add is N chlorosuccinamide. So there's a weak heteroatom heteroatom bond there. So you're going to attack the chlorine atom. It's kind of like what I showed you over there. So there's this initial step when you chlorinate the sulfide lone pair. Make this chlorosulfonium intermediate. Sulfur with three things as a sulfonium. And so now the issue is what happens next? If you don't add, have anything else present or add anything else, you can kind of imagine that this succinamide anion can come back in and attack from the top. But if you're clever, you'll add some sort of an alcohol in this reaction. And that's what makes it the Cori Kim oxidation, some alcohol that has uh, alpha hydrogen removed so that the alcohol could be oxidized. So now what happens is your nucleophile comes in and adds and again you don't displace the chloride in a concerted reaction. I'm not going to draw the sulfurane intermediate but what's going to happen is the alcohol will add and then it'll sit there as a sulfurane there'll be some proton transfer and then the chloride will leave. So it's not <coughs> going to be very careful. So if this were isopropanol or some secondary alcohol, I'm going to be very careful here to draw out some of these uh, substituents. Actually, I'm wishing, and I'm kind of sad that I drew, let me, you can just scratch that out if you're using a pen. I want to draw it over here to get my sulfide. Sorry. I'll just erase that. You can just scratch that out if you're using a pen right now. Because you'll notice how carefully I want to position that proton. That's what I'm going to do. So you have this sulfonium intermediate. You've done an exchange. Oxygen attacks, transfer a proton, and then make the chloride make that three mechanistic steps. And so now we've got this oxygen attached to sulfur, and now this succinamide anion that's floating around there can act as a base to pull off this um, one of these two protons, or one of the protons on these methyl groups. Who would have thought that? If you just take trimethyl sulfonium, the pKa is very low. We'll, we'll talk about that shortly. So it's very easy to get these protons off. When you do that, this illid lone pair, that carbanion like lone pair on the illid, there's sulfur plus, carbon minus. Let me just draw it here CH2 so we can see that's kind of like a carbanion. It's now perfectly situated where it can just reach over and pluck off this proton. When you do that, you end up oxidizing the alcohol to a ketone or an aldehyde. And then the other byproduct of this reaction is just <clears throat> it, it's just this dimethyl sulfide that we started with. OK, this is the Cori Kim oxidation. This is the key step. Um, may not be obvious to you, but that's a paracyclic reaction called the retroline reaction. That's the next thing we're going to talk about in the class here, four classes of paracyclic reactions. Who would like to just pop into a double bond? Over the... Uh, the electrons? I'm sorry, I missed the... How do they work? I mean, how much, why would that just bend over like that? Form a double bond. Oh, that's a resonance structure. Uh, in other words, is in other words, how important is this resonance structure where? Is it just not where it looks like, like that this? Or? Uh, you know, it's a resonance structure. You could use this resonance structure to do exactly the same error motion. You know, there's not a lot of pi character here to the okay. um, between second and third row atoms. But if you wanted, you could draw this resonance structure and do the same. Right? 
But it will still be valuable. Yes, the same reaction, just we could draw on a different resonance. Okay. okay, so that's the uh, Cori chem oxidation. There's a much more common, I don't think any of you have ever used the Cori chem oxidation or are likely to. Uh, there's a much more <coughs> super ultra model version of this reaction called the Swern oxidation, which is uh, more widely used. And it's basically the same reaction. It's just a slicker way of generating this chlorosulfosium interview. So instead of using stinky dimethyl sulfide, which kind of can't avoid it, because it appears at the end, you start off with DMSO, which is a common solvent in the lab. Right? It's not this volatile um, <coughs> dimethyl sulfide. So you start off with dimethyl sulfoxide, common solvent, and we add a super powerful electrophile called oxalyl chloride. We draw oxalyl chloride in That's oxalyl chloride. And we've already talked about in the Pummer reaction how, how nucleophilic those oxygens can be toward positively charged electrophiles. So there's a lot of partial positive charge on those carbons. And I'm kind of wishing that I had drawn the O minus and S plus here. But Get the idea. The whole point behind adding, let me first draw the, the key chlorosulfonium intermediate that you generate. It's the same chlorosulfonium intermediate that we drew with the, the Cori Kim oxidation. Um, but it's kind of slick how, how you generate that. So, of course, carbon substitutes through tetrahedral intermediates. I think that's kind of obvious and known. And so now you can debate on, on the mechanisms, but as to the order of events here, I'm going to draw this as going through this oxalate species. Because we know it's easy to substitute acid chlorides. And so now this decomposes. <coughs> so, uh, and what did I just do here? I left off my got the chloride here. <clears throat> and I'm going to add back in to make a sulfurane intermediate. And when I do this, I think it's obvious to see how we're going to generate these other byproducts in the reaction. The other byproducts in this reaction are carbon dioxide. There's the carbon dioxide. carbon monoxide and chloride anion. <clears throat> so let me just draw those byproducts here. Chloride, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. Totally innocuous under the reaction. And now everything else is just like the Cori Kim, a little bit. You've got this stuff floating around, and now you come along with your syringe and you add in your alcohol and your amine. In this case, we have to add triethylamine we don't have a succinimate anion floating around in our reaction, a basic succinimate anion that can deprotonate this. You have to add your own base to this reaction. But when you add those, it goes through the same type of mechanism. Um, I'll just, the rest of this is like the core EPM oxidation. And there's a vast number of reagents other than oxalyl chloride that do this. Those have different names. Fitzner, Moffat oxidations, Moffat oxidations. But it's all the same idea where you deprotonate to make a sulfonium. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, talk about uh, just regular sulfonium. Sulfonium, that means sulfur with three things attached to it and a positive charge. It's just like an oxonium is oxygen. Let's go ahead and draw it a sulfonium salt, or just a sulfonium ion. Here's a sulfonium ion. It's got one too many things attached to the sulfur. It's like you just added methyl iodide to the methyl sulfide or something. And what's astounding here is that the pKa for these protons is 18. Very easy to deprotonate these. Right? It doesn't take any special effort to pull those protons off. You can make a, an analogous type of reagent by adding methyl iodide 
uh, to DMSO. And then if you deprotonate that, <coughs> we had methyl iodide to DMSO, you'll also end up with a positive charge of sulfur. And if you deprotonate that, you'll end up with this sulfoxonium illid. So this is a sulfonium illid. Draw the illid. <laughs> I'll draw it on this side. Now it's an illid. There's a plus and a minus. Now over here, this is a sulfoxonium illid. And the pKa for this is pretty much the same. These are actually pKa primes because I draw the anion. I draw prime here. So the pKa prime for that anion. You're on 18, very easy to pull protons off. But when you do that, these are really, really reactive. Well, what you need to think about when you see stuff like this is frustration. There's this huge frustration because you've got this lone pair that's <coughs> going to fill it, and it wants to form a pi bond, but those sulfur orbitals are just so big, they're the wrong size, they're so far away. So you can't get effective pi bond formation here, so you're stuck with this plus and minus right next to each other. It makes these species very reactive. See what happens when we when we take sulfonium illids uh, and we react to them with carbonyl compounds. We're going to take one example here where we take uh, just the regular sulfonium illid. You take trimethyl sulfonium ion, you deprotonate it as a sodium hydride. And now this carbanion lone pair here, we just draw those. Come in and attack carbonyl groups. I don't think that's that surprising. When you attack a carbonyl group, it sets you up to have a leaving group right next door. So now I've got this new carbon carbon bond and I've got this alkoxide O minus. And right next door to that, I've got a leaving group now. This is perfectly set up oxygen atom to push out that sulfide leaving group. So that you get an epoxide. This is a standard way to make an epoxide. It's one, two addition of sulfonium. Is it critical that your alpha carbons are saturated? No. It's not. So you're going forward. You, so like if, if you didn't have that double bond and then the two methyl groups on the left side, would you form like a uh, enolate or something? No. No, okay. I mean, uh, in other words, is the yield going to be 80% instead of 100? Okay. Yeah. You, know, you can do it if you have alpha protons. Okay, let's contrast it. I don't think you could have ever guessed this difference in reality. Let's go ahead and contrast this with sulfoxonium illids. So again, if you take DMSO and you alkylate it with methyl iodide, you get trimethyl sulfoxonium iodide. And then if you deprotonate that, you can make the illid. And it looks kind of like the sulfonium millet. And it can attack the carbonyl just like the sulfonium millet. <clears throat> and there's no way you could have known this, but that is readily reversible. So I'm going to draw that, that reverse reaction. In other words, it's just slow enough. It's slow enough for the O- minus to push out the, sul the DMSO leaving group. But what happens is you end up getting the back reaction. So in other words, Instead of doing an SN2 reaction, what happens is you pop that back out quickly. You couldn't have guessed that. There's no way you could have known that that would be fast. <clears throat> that this addition would be reversible and fast. And so eventually, this will come around and add into a conjugate addition reaction. I'm just going to leave the electrons right here on that alpha carbon instead of drawing the phenol into the structure. 
so now it's, it's just like attacking the carbonyl. You're set up with a nucleophilic lone pair and a leaving group. So instead of getting the epoxide, you get the cyclopropane. I'm going to draw one, I don't generally talk about synthetic applications here in this class, but I feel like this is kind of a dramatic one. This is a, a a clinically used drug called drospirinone. It's a birth control pill called GAS. And it's got these two cyclopropanes in here. And all of, both of those cyclopropanes are made through this sulfoxonium millet chemistry. They do one of these treatments here or with an excess of that. And I'm not showing you the whole substrate. That's the way they install the cyclopropanes. Okay, so um, we're going to stop there. We're done with the sulfur chemistry. And I don't think we quite have enough time uh, to cover paracyclic reactions, but I'm going to give you a heads up about what's coming in the class. So, <clears throat> what's going to happen in the next several weeks, uh, so this next week you're going to go in, you guys will be coming here learning to do electronic structure calculations to visualize orbitals. HOMOs, LUMOs, any orbital really. To visualize charge distribution. And one of the powers of being able to visualize orbitals is it's going to set you up to visualize four types of paracyclic reactions. And I'm just going to list them for you today, and we'll come back and talk about this in great detail. So this will just give you something that you want. So there are four types of canonical paracyclic reactions. And I think here's one that everybody knows. This is a very specific example of a cycloaddition. This is called the Diels-Alder reaction. And if you can understand the Diels-Alder reaction, you can understand all the other types of, of cycloaddition reactions. And when you push the arrows, I, I think everybody in here knows this. You have this sort of cyclic transition state where all of the pi electrons are engaged. So that's class one of the four types of paracyclic reactions. So you have Diels-Alder reactions, plus two dipolar cycloaddition reactions, um, heliotropic extrusions, uh, they all fit in there. Now, the important part, the point to this is if I do the arrow pushing backwards, I don't need to characterize that as a different type of reaction. It's really just a retro cycloaddition. We're going to consider the forward and the reverse reactions as the same reaction because they proceed through the same transition state. So the second type of paracyclic reaction of the four canonical types. It's called an ene reaction. And all I'm going to do with an ene reaction is I'm going to replace one of these pi bonds in the diene with a sigma bond. Not to carbon, but to a proton. It's too slow to carbon. And so now I can push the arrows in exactly the same way. I'll take this alkene and I'll grab that proton. I'll just push all around. So all I've done is I've replaced a single pi bond with a CH bond. We call that an ene reaction. And you can have retro ene reactions. I'm not going to push the arrows the backwards way. Actually, retro ene reactions are more common than ene reactions. OK, the next class of paracyclic reactions are called electrocyclic reactions. Electrocyclic. So the first two, two components come together. And a four plus, in this cycle addition here, two components to come together. In an E reaction, two components to come together. In an electrocyclic reaction, it's all unimolecular. So here's a canonical electrocyclic reaction. And it looks kind of like, all of these look kind of like six-membered ring. I'm showing you the six-membered ring examples. You can have other ring sizes. The arrow pushing is the same, basically. So I start with an open system and I end up with a closed ring. And again, you can push the arrows in the backwards direction. Um, just push and have a retro version of that. An electrocyclic ring closure or an electrocyclic ring closure. And then the last class of paracyclic reactions that we're going to talk about in great detail is this, our sigmatropic reactions. 
And I'm, again, going to show you the canonical six-member ring version of the Coke rearrangement, or a 3-3 three, three sigma true. So again, the, the electrocyclic reaction and the sigmatropic rearrangements are unimolecular. We don't have two pieces coming together. Now these aren't very interesting. But as soon as you add substituents to these, alkoxy groups, carbonyl groups, you're going to become very interested in issues like regiochemistry or the speed of the reaction. And that's where looking at the energies of the molecular orbitals, the homo and lumo, will matter. And that's why looking at the shapes of the MO, where is the lumo big? Or where is the lumo small? Where is the homo big? That's when those things will matter to you. That's why doing it uh, electronic structural calculations is an easy way to get access to those um, when you can't just figure it out. OK, so, uh, so next week, we're going to do electronic structural calculations, and then we'll come back and have more lectures on these four classes.